Hi everyone, welcome to AI Crack channel. This is Akash Gangwar and today we'll be studying indefinite integrals lecture one. In this lecture, we'll be talking about standard integrals and basics of substitution. Okay, so let's begin a lecture with the definition of integration. And as we all know, integration is the reverse process of differentiation, right? So in derivatives, what we studied, d by dx of x square was two x, right? So if we do the reverse process of differentiation, basically integrate two x, we should be getting x square, right? But here's one problem. If we differentiate d by dx of x square plus one and d by dx of x square plus two, we'll still be getting two x, right? So integral two x should not be x square only, right? It can be x square plus one, it can be x square plus two. So we have to add one constant over here. Okay, that is the constant of integration. So whenever we are integrating, we have to add one constant of integration, but this is applicable for indefinite integration, right? We'll be having certain limits for definite integration. So we'll not be having this constant, but in case of indefinite integration, we have to add one constant over here. Okay. And now let's talk about some basic standard formulae based on the basic definition that is reverse of differentiation. So we're not applying any method over here to find out the formulae. What we are doing, we're just doing the reverse of differentiation. So let's first differentiate this one to see if we get x is per n or not, right? So what do we have? We have d by dx of x raised to the power n plus one divided by n plus one, right? So what we can do, we can take out one upon n plus one as common because in that in the differentiation process we can do that. We can take out constant term as common. So we've got one upon n plus one as common outside d by dx of x raised to the power n plus one, right? Now if you differentiate this one, you'll be getting this becomes one upon n plus one multiplied by this becomes n plus one, sorry. Multiplied by x is per n, so this and this gets cancelled out. So we have got x is per n is the answer, right? Now if you look at this carefully, n cannot be minus one. Why? Because this would become x is per minus one dx, right? That is nothing but one upon x dx. Now if you remember, one upon x is the derivative of ln x, right? So for n equals to minus one, this is not applicable. It's applicable for n equals to any other value except minus one. Okay. So for n equals to minus one, we have actually derivative as ln x. Sorry, integral as ln x. Okay. So this one is written over here. Now you have to remember this page and this page as well. By hook or crook, there is no option because these are the standard formula which you have to remember, right? Now add two more over here. That is integral sec x tan x dx, and that is sec x plus c. And similarly, integral cosec x cot x dx equals to minus cosec x plus c. Okay, you have to remember these two. Now let's talk about theorems of integration. So the first one is integral k times f x dx equals to k times integral f x dx, where k is in constant. It's very simple, no? So let's say we have integral 2x square dx. So we can take this two out of the integral. So this becomes two times integral x square dx. So this is what we mean by the first property. Now. The second theorem is if f1x, f2x, f3x, finite number are functions of x, then integral f1x plus minus f2x plus minus f3x till the end equals to integral f1x dx plus minus integral f2x dx plus minus till the end. Right. So what do we mean by that? Let's say we have integral x square plus 3x cubed plus 2x dx. Right. So we can write this as with the help of second theorem. This would become x square dx plus integral 3x cube dx plus integral 2x dx, right? Now, if we talk about the third one, that is the most important one. So if integral small fx dx equals to capital fx, then integral small f of ax plus minus b dx equals to one upon capital, one upon a capital F ax plus minus b. Okay. So let's take my example. Let's say integral cos x dx. That is nothing but sin x, right? So if I write integral cos of, let's say 2x plus 3 dx. So what that would be? That would be 1 upon 2 because we have 1 upon a over here, right? 1 upon 2 sine of 2x plus 3, okay? Plus c, okay? So let's take one more example. Let's say we have integral 1 upon x dx equals to ln x, right? So if we do 1 upon x plus 1 dx, equals to that would become ln of x plus one plus c, right? Now, similarly, if we do integral one upon two x plus one, right, dx, that would become one upon two ln of two x plus one plus c, right? So getting the point. 
So this property is very important. And now let's solve this example. Now our basic agenda while solving this example or any of these examples, basic examples is to reduce these expressions into the standard format, right? into the standard integrals, right? That's what we want to do over here. Now, if you remember from trigonometry, you can see that this is nothing but cos of 2x, right? Half angle formula, right? In terms of tan x. Now, if you don't remember that, let's drive that once again. So we have one, one minus 10 square x divided by one plus 10 square x. So one minus sine square x by cos square x divided by one plus sine square x by cos square x, right? Now, if you take the LCM over here, you'll be getting cos square x minus sine square x divided by cos square x plus sine square x. So this is nothing but one. And you know that this is nothing but cos of 2x, right? So either you can remember it or you can just, you know, convert this into sine and cos and you can derive it, right? Now, this big expression has turned into a very simpler one, right? So this is nothing but integral cos of 2x dx, right? Now that is nothing but one upon two sine 2x plus c, simple. Right. And now let's solve the example where the expression has become a little more complicated. Right. But what we can see, we can see one plus X square in the denominator. Now, whenever you see one plus X square in the denominator, in case of an integral, the first thought that should come to your mind is about tan inverse X. Why? Because derivative of tan inverse X is one upon one plus X square. Right. So this is how we should be proceeding in this example. Now we have to create one upon one plus X square, right. To get that standard integral of tan inverse X, right. So we have to separate out these terms based on the property of integrals, right? So this would become integral x is per four plus x square upon two times one plus x square dx, right? Plus integral one upon two times one plus x square dx, right? Now, if you take x square is common over here, so you'll be getting x square multiplied by one plus x square dx divided by two times one plus x square. So this and this gets canceled out. Now over here, what we have got, We've got one upon two outside because of the property of uh, integrals. This becomes dx upon one plus x square. Now this is a standard integral and this is also a standard integral. So this actually becomes one upon two integral x square dx. It's pretty standard, right? So that's how you have to solve and think. And now let's solve one more example. So we have integral one plus tan square x divided by one plus cot square x dx. In this case, again, we have to simplify using trigonometric identities, right? So one plus tan square x becomes x square x and one plus cot square becomes cos x square x dx right and this actually becomes tan square x if you convert this into cos and this into sine you'll get tan square x dx over here right now we don't know the integral of tan square x right but we do know the integral of six square so we can write this in terms of six square x minus one dx right now for integral six square what we'll be getting we'll be getting tan x and for minus one we'll be getting minus x plus c very simple right and now let's solve this one. So we have integral two plus three x square divided by x square one plus x square dx, right? Now we can again see one plus x square in the denominator. So that should trigger the thought of tan inverse x in our mind, right? But we have additional x square multiplied over here. So we have to ultimately get rid of this x square, right? That should be a thought process. So we can write this as two plus two x square plus x square divided by x square one plus x square, right? This is one possibility right? Separating out like this one, or what we can do, we can write this as three X square plus three minus one, right? Divide by X square one plus X square DX. So we'll be solving by using both of these methods, right? So let's solve the first one. So in this case, what we are getting integral two times one plus X square divided by X square one plus X square DX plus x square dx upon x square one plus x square. Now over here, this gets canceled out. Over here, this gets canceled out. So this is the standard one. This is the standard one, right? Simple. Now let's talk about the second method. Now in the second method, this can be written as integral three x square plus three minus one. Okay, divide by x square one plus x square dx. Now this becomes three times x square plus one divided by x square one plus x square dx minus integral of dx upon x square one plus x square, right? Now this and this gets canceled out and this actually becomes a very standard integral, right? 
Now, if we talk about the second one, that's not a standing error. Okay, so how do we solve that? Now, whenever you see one upon a times a plus one, you can always write that as one upon a minus one upon a plus one. For example, let's say we have one upon two, one upon two multiplied by three, right? This can be written as one upon two minus one upon three. Or let's say we have one upon three multiplied by four. So okay, this can be written as one upon three minus one upon four, right? Always. So whenever you see this kind of pattern, always have this kind of thing in your mind, right? So now let's split the function based on that. So we have one upon x square minus one upon one plus x square dx. Now again, you can write this as integral dx upon x square minus integral dx upon one plus x square. So this is tan inverse x, and this is again very standard one, right? Simple. Now let's talk about methods of integration. So we have total three methods, substitution, integration by parts and partial fractions, which are relevant for PGDB, right? Until now, PGDB has just focused on first and second, that is substitution and by parts. They have not touched partial fractions until now, but we'll be studying that as well for just in case, right? So let's first talk about substitution. Okay. So what is the idea behind substitution? When do we need it? Why do we need it? Let's see that with the help of an example, right? So let's say we have an integral sine x sine of cos x dx, right? Now, can you solve this integral with the help of standard formats? No, we cannot do that, right? So for that, let's say we take the substitution as cos x equals to t, okay? Now, if you differentiate on both sides, what we'll be getting? We'll be getting sine x equals to dt by dx, right? So if you multiply dx over here, we'll be getting sine x dx equals to dt, okay? Now you can see sine x, you can see dx over here. So if you club both of them, we'll be getting dt, right? So this integral becomes sine t dt, right? dt is sine x dx and sine of cos x is sine t. So this has become the standard format, right? Now the second important question is how do we choose what we have to substitute, right? In the previous example, we had integral sine x sine of cos x dx, right? And we chose cos x as t, why? Because we know that sine and sine of cos x is actually a composite function and we cannot integrate composite functions directly. So that's why we had to choose the argument of the composite function as t, right? To convert that composite function into a regular function. That should be a first thought process, right? That should be a first idea while choosing the substitution. Now, secondly, we know that derivative of cos x would club sine x and dx into dt. That should be a second thought process, right? That should be a second idea. So based on these two key ideas, you can solve majority of the substitution problems. Okay. So today's lecture was still here only. And in the next lecture, we'll be solving more problems on substitution. So let's meet in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.